I had a couple other questions about the, um, that were, that came up in the PRC hearing examiner's report that I just wanted to ask about. So the document notes that you'll pay PNM shareholders $391 million more than the market value of the stocks. And then also, um, I guess I'm just curious, like why, why pay more than you have to? Can you explain that? Uh, very simple. You know, I think, you know, first of all, um, there has never been a merger case in the U.S. And, you know, you know, there have been many mergers in the U.S. in the utility sector that has never looked at the premium paid to the shareholders to justify how much customers get or not. Why? A, because, you know, we paid a premium to PNM. If you actually look at the premium, not over the last day, you look at the six months is negative. So what does it mean? If the, you know, the, actually the share price goes down, then the, the rate payers should pay to the shareholders. It doesn't work like that, okay? So you need to pay the shareholders to make sure they approve the transaction. And we did. And over one year, one week, we paid a premium. Actually, if you go back and you look at over the share price six months before, it's actually negative premium. But that premium is to the shareholders. If now, you know, the share price goes down, rate payers are not supposed to pay to shareholders. In the same way, if they get a premium, they're not supposed to get the same amount of money. It's totally unrelated. There was another example, you know, you know, you know, some, you know, party, you know, was raising well or some, you did some news, you know, the, the compensation to some management because they're, you know, most of that compensation was already established in their, you know, compensation, in their, you know, compensation packages and it's long-term, you know, a, a compensation they were entitled. So there is nothing we agreed. We don't even agreed one thing, you know, with Pat and her team, you know, that because of the merger, they're going to be paid. They already had it there. So that's why it's very customary, but you need to pay a premium to shareholders. By the way, you know, this transaction is, you know, as, as we said before, it's about creating value, you know, locally, creating jobs. If you see at the, you know, the multiples, I think Pat did the transaction, which is very well presentable. It's one of the lowest multiples. Look at the other transactions in the U.S., Two or three companies bankrupt. Two other three or three companies issuing capital because they pay too much. That's not what you should do if you want to have a legacy of your company doing well. So that's why we're very comfortable to explain those things in a proper manner. Right. So I also wanted to ask that document. I also noticed that you'll develop non-utility activities in the Southwest, which is why you're paying um, $2.3 billion more than the book value of the p &M assets. What are these non-utility assets that we're talking about? First of all, Laura, let me, yep. I say, Laura, if you look at what um, JP Morgan paid for El Paso, for example, it was a lot more um, than it was paid for P&M. And if you look at any company in the United States, you don't sell yourself unless someone is giving you a premium. There's actually a court case going on today where they're, they're claiming that um, Barry Diller underbought, underpaid for Tinder, right? So most people sue over the fact that you get underpaid. And so what Ibadrola saw in the value was, if you look at our renewables, as I mentioned again, we're the, we're the third best in wind and solar potential in the United States. We're a very small state and a small system. So they see the ability, and because we know the local permitting process, the local landowners, all that, to build that infrastructure in, to build um, solar, wind, and, and transmission, to export, that stuff to other states, right? We're already in the energy imbalance market, saving our customers money. And so we can continue to take advantage of that infrastructure and take advantage of a, of a good way. We're not sort of taking it from New Mexico and giving it to Arizona or California. We're, ta we're taking advantage of it on behalf of all New Mexicans to keep the proceeds here. So I'm sorry, Pedro, I interrupted, but. Oh, I think the, the, the comment you made, uh, I think Laura is very, very interesting because the customers, pay their bills in relation, as you said, more or less, let's call it book value. That's the rate base. If you buy a company and you pay a premium, that's a problem for the shareholders. Okay. The rate payers, you know, do not have to pay for that. Okay. So from that point of view, you know, if you were to tell me, well, we're paying 2 billion over book value and the rate payers will have to pay the return on equity in their bills because of our premium. No, that's our problem. The rate payers continue to pay in relation to the book value of the investment. So it's our issue as a shareholder to do that or not. Okay, and so what would some of the, the like non-utility activities be? Can you just clarify that for Yes, me? the, the, the non-utility operations is anything which is not regulated, okay? So you think about wind as being regulated, but you also have non-regulated wind generation, okay? Transmission, 
is not regulated by the public commission. You have projects which are transmission. We know we tell counterparties that they need transmission. Those are the non-regulated activities. And New Mexico, for example, if you were to build generation and export that to other you know, states or to go into Mexico, that's non-regulated. You know? So it may be regulated by FERC. It may be you know, counterparties, private counterparties. There are many activities that can be done that are not regulated. That same PRC document noted that the merger was not designed to benefit PNM customers. I was hoping you could um, each uh, respond to that because I think that that took some people by surprise there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and let me clarify: the the hearing examiner he provided a pathway. So he provided a pathway on a, on what we would call a modified stipulation, and he added three things to it. He extended the what we would call a rate freeze. We had agreed to not to do a rate case uh, until June 1st of 2022. What he recommended is that we don't file a rate case until December of 2022. We agreed to that. And when we filed our, our uh, report on Friday, he also asked for uh, reliability uh, metrics and he asked for reliability penalties. Pat addressed that and we agreed with that. We'll be the only utility in the state that has reliability penalties, but we're confident we can continue to deliver on the reliability that we have. The last thing is he, he required that we have an independent board uh, made up of uh, four uh, non-utility non individuals or, and three that would be management. And we agreed to that. And they're all New Mexico residents. So they're very in tune. So to go back to your original question, what's in it for New Mexico? It's a New Mexico REN board. They'll stay in tune with what's going on. There's rate credits. There's a provision that keeps us out of filing a rate increase. We haven't had a rate increase since 2016 was our last rate case with rates in effect in 2018. So it'll be a five-year period um, uh, from that perspective. And there's a whole lot of commitments that are in there that protect the customer. Local management, absolutely important. And you've heard Pedro talk about that. It's the same people running the utility, ensuring that it's reliable, affordable, um, and, you know, it's environmentally uh, uh, sound and, and, and so forth. So that's what's important. So there was a pathway that was created there, and we, we agreed to every, ele el every element on it. If you look at the monetary benefits alone, right, there's $94 million for customers in rate benefits, whether it's a rate credit, where it's forgiveness of, of arrearages because of, of COVID, um, whether it's electricity for customers that, that don't have it, there are economic development benefits that total more than $200 million between the jobs and just straight out dollars for economic development. So there are those kinds of things that are also direct customer um, benefits. So I think we would disagree with the hearing examiner that the merger was not designed to benefit customers. Obviously, the shareholders benefit, but the environment benefits, our employees benefit, and the customers benefit. I think if you just complete that with you know, a couple of examples, the first one is when you compare the benefits that you know, are quantifiable that we have put on the table, you know, rate credits, you know, uh, low income help, you know, you know, efficiency things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the jobs to be created, all those figures are more than any other transaction approved in New Mexico by the public commission. So we are very comfortable that the benefits that they saw in other transactions, we have exceeded them. But second, in terms of you know, what we want to do is to go beyond. That's why the job component is very important for us. If you see JP Morgan when they got it approved, JP Morgan had never run a US utility in their lives. So I would be concerned, you know, potentially if you buy a utility, you've never run, run a utility. Well, they got it approved. We have exceeded you know, what they conceded, okay? So from that point of view, the benefits that we have, we are very comfortable and we trust regulators because they usually, you know, they, they approve transactions in a way and we believe that's the way they should approve transactions in the future. And these are two very recent transactions. We have exceeded the benefits that they approved in those transactions. 23 out of 24 interveners support or don't oppose the merger. So I think that's a pretty good endorsement of the fact there's only one party that's against it, that this makes sense for our state. 